thank you everyone for coming here today. It's our first seminar <laughs> from uh, our seminar research seminar series. So I'm really happy to see all of you here, and I hope you, you know, keep coming to all the seminars. So um, today, uh, before we start, I would like to thank uh, the IPP communication team. I um, don't know where they are now. Angelo, you're there. Angelo, Madi, and Sylvia. Yeah, thank you very much. But also Rainer, our uh, deputy director. I saw him somewhere. Yes. And also Dominique Gracia, the institute manager. I don't think she's here. Is she? No? But anyway, I would like to say thank you to her as well for all the support. So I know you're here basically to see uh, Ben, not me, but, and I don't blame you, I'm here as well to hear what you have to say and see him, but I would like to talk a little bit about our research seminar series. We, uh, this term we would like to be looking into, uh, into many challenges that society is facing right now, in the UK but also globally. So, you know, be it environmental or social, economic, all these challenges we would like to trying to understand what's happening. And the idea of that moment here on Wednesday is literally to provide a very rich platform to have a discussion that can be productive. And you know, your engagement, your participation as an audience is something that we see as key to you know, enrich that discussion. And we also hope that, that that conversation taking place here can become ideas and projects and collaborations that can then of course, impact uh, and influence policy. So today we are discussing the power of the finance and the power of finance <laughs> with Ben, but if you can see in our calendar, I don't know if everybody can see here, we also we will touch the issue of sustainability with Michael uh, Pauling, uh, who is a British architect. Uh, we also will talk about equality, development and citizenship with uh, Dr. Robitel Niaji Pale, who is an assistant professor in international social and uh, public policy at LSE. And finally, we have a roundtable looking to inflation, which is also quite interesting. We have Thorsten Bell, who is the chief executive of uh, the UK think tank called Resolution Foundation. Uh, Martin Connings, who is a professor of political economy and social theory at the University of Sydney. And I have Nersisson, who is Associate Professor of Economics at Franklin and Marshall College in the US. And then finally, Isabel Weber, uh, who is Assistant Professor at economic, uh, of Economics at the University of, uh, that word, Massachusetts, Armorest. Oh, I managed. Uh, so, you know, it's going to be a great uh, uh, roundtable, and that's our last seminar. So, yes, I, I can't bring Ben here every day, so now every Wednesday, but as you can see, there is much more to come, so please, we do uh, hope you come back. And that's it. Uh, Josh, see you. Many thanks, um, Carolina. Um, and delighted uh, to, to be here. My name is Josh Ryan Collins. I'm Associate Professor in Economics and Finance uh, here at the Institute. And um, I'm delighted to introduce to you today uh, Benjamin Brown, who is um, a Senior Research Fellow and political economist at the Max Planck Institute for the Study of Societies, a very prestigious German uh, research institute. Uh, ben studies the political economy of finance, of economic institutions and policies, and the nexus uh, between them. He's done some extremely important work on the role of central banks in the modern economy, in particular the European Central Bank, uh, and developed some really important uh, new ideas, I think, in this in this field, such as the, the concept of infrastructural power, the uh, essentially the ability to shape political and economic outcomes simply by determining the uh, infrastructural trajectory of uh, the financial system. Um, uh, I'm a big fan of his of his work there because that's my my area as well. What, I'm going to, what he's going to talk to you about today, though, is his more recent uh, research on asset manager capitalism. And this is a, a, quite a, a radical um, new conceptualization of the role of the financial system in modern capitalist economies, which I'm not going to talk about because he's going to cover that ground. But just to give you a bit more background on Ben, he's been at Max Planck now for uh, six, six years six or seven years, um, but he's also um, held visiting fellowships at uh, Harvard uh, and at um, 
uh, at the Minda de Gunsberg Center for European Studies at Harvard, um, and um, is uh, uh, done many uh, policy relevant uh, reports as well for for NGOs. So he's not just a um, theor ivory tower theorist, mm -hmm. but very much a policy impact type of person. Um, so um, we're also joined today um, by Olga Mikheva, who is a Marie Curie Research Fellow here at um, the UCL Institute um, as well. Um, she, her focus is on um, the governance of financial systems um, in particular, um, and she is um, going to uh, discuss Ben's uh, work. She's also been doing some work on um, sustainable finance, the governance of sustainable finance and innovation, and um, this: how do we create bureaucracies that more effectively deliver public value? Um, so, without further ado, I will hand over to you, Ben. Thanks. Thank you so much, um, both of you, and I'm really happy to be able to speak here today. Um, it happens that this paper that I'm presenting today just uh, came out yesterday. Um, so, um, yeah, I'll try to present uh, a brief, brief version of it. Um, this is the agenda for my talk, and I will start by um, explaining briefly what I mean by the uh, structural power um, structural power in general, and the structural power of finance in particular. Um, so although structural power has several dimensions, in, usually in international political economy, the most important mechanism um, that underpins the structural power of business in general, and finance in particular, is exit. So um, the greater the ability of liquid uh, financial capital to, to, to move, and especially to move across borders, the greater the structural power of its owners vis-a-vis -vis governments, on the one hand, but also vis-a-vis -vis other private actors, um, such as labor uh, and uh, local business. So there's a whole uh, uh, literature. I won't, I won't go into the details here. Um, but rather, I, I want to ask, uh, what are the assumptions that, um, about the role and nature of the financial system that underpin this literature? Uh, because I want to sort of, uh, the, the paper questions these, uh, these assumptions and argues that things have changed quite a bit. Um, so here I show you two alternative, uh, yeah views of, of the financial system that also, I think, refer to a historical shift um, in the f uh, form and function of, the, of finance. And uh, so from the conventional perspective, the function of finance is the financing of, of economic activity uh, to allocate scarce uh, financial capital to its most productive uses. The primary institutional form of financial intermediation here is banking and capital markets. And the structural power of finance is a function of its ability to threaten to exit individual sectors or uh, firms, sectors, or even entire countries. This exit-based theory of the structural power of finance is sound, uh, of course. But today, the non-financial sector's reliance on external financing has really uh, dramatically diminished um, over the last few decades. Um, so uh, I want to show you uh, three charts to support this argument about the decline or more uh, provocatively formulated the end of exit, which is the next part of, of the presentation. Um, so here I'm showing you some uh, calculations that I did based on a methodology of, um, that I adopted from Corbett and Jenkins and then was uh, recently used and explained by Till van Trieck, where I'm trying to uh, use financial accounts data to... All of this data is on the, on the US, um, so I'm, the paper is on, on, on the United States, really first and foremost. Um, and what you can see here is that the vast majority of corporate investment, so um, of gross fixed investment, uh, is financed from internal funds, that's the blue area, that is uh, retained profits. Um, it doesn't always add up to 100% because 
the method isn't perfect and the data isn't perfect. Um, but in theory, you know, this should, uh, should be the sources for all of corporate uh, gross fixed investment. Um, and you can see that the category equity, uh, which is the blue, uh, uh, the light blue at the bottom here, um, you can see there that the stock market has not been a source of net financing for corporations actually since the <coughs> 1970s. Um, and its contribution has turned negative uh, since the 1980s. And maybe more remarkably, uh, the loans, traditional loans, also have not made a positive contribution uh, in the aggregate for uh, corporate investment in the, in the US. So even loans have turned negative in the last 10 years, basically, the light green area there. Now we can drill down a little further into the equity uh, category. So this is a chart, um, the top, uh, unfortunately, is barely visible here, uh, which is gross issuance of uh, new corporate equity, um, new shares, whereas the negative numbers are uh, share retirement via mergers and acquisitions and uh, via re stock repurchases. And again, you can just see the same thing uh, based, uh, uh, visualized differently and based on different data that the net issuance of stock of um, corporations in the U.S. has been negative. Uh, basically, uh, yeah, forever, but it has become uh, the drain of uh, money uh, out of the corporate sector uh, or listed corporate sector um, in the U.S. via the stock market has accelerated in recent decades. And then the third uh, chart is about the uh, banking sector uh, and bank lending, which of course is traditionally the, the source of, of capital for, for firms um, that, is, that is most important for the financing of uh, investment, maybe n n more so in bank-based systems than in the US. Uh, but even here you can see that in the first panel you can see that a bank's share of total financial assets has dramatically declined. Um, over time. And the second panel shows that uh, corporate loans have seen the largest decline as a category of uh, bank assets, uh, whereas uh, real estate loans, of course, have massively increased. This is a picture that uh, is true also for many other countries. Uh, Dick Kutzema, for example, has called this the, the, the debt shift in bank lending. So if corporations have really become less dependent on external finance, then this should reduce the exit-based power of financial actors vis-a-vis -vis the non-financial sector. That's, that's kind of the first part of, of the paper. Um, um, so the broader point here is that financialization, which is a development since over the last 50 years, as, as most of these uh, time series that I just showed you, Financialization and, and, and increasing financial sector power over, non, over the non-financial sector is not, it's not the same thing. It's not one thing is the same as, as the other. I think we need to uh, think, quite, uh, think a little harder about this. And here in this paper, I try to do this for one specific part of the economy, which is basically listed firms, and a look at the role of shareholders. Um, one could also look, for example, at non-listed firms and look at, uh, so I'm looking at public uh, equity asset managers. Uh, one could do the same, of course, and others are doing that, and look at private equity asset managers and their power vis-a-vis -vis, vis non-financial firms. And if anything, their control-based power is even higher, of course, because usually a private equity firm <laughs> buys 100% uh, of the equity of um, of a company, whereas here we are talking about smaller stakes. I will get to that. So uh, when we talk about asset manager capitalism, uh, we should always uh, keep in mind that there was once a configuration that uh, famous Marxist uh, theorist and uh, German polit uh, social democrat um, uh, Hilferding theorized as, as finance capital. Um, so when we talk about what happens when institutional capital pools grow and increase their footprint in the non-financial economy, we're basically talking about uh, a configuration that existed in the US and in Germany around 1900. Um, and so that's what uh, Hilferding called finance capital. 
And for him, finance was, and that's crucial, not just a source of financing industry, but it was a means of reorganizing industry, or rather, uh, you know, what finance was doing was uh, reorganizing industry to, uh, to better meet its needs. And how did this come about? Well, in Hil Hilferding's telling, it came about because capitalists made profits that exceeded what they could or wished to reinvest in their businesses. Basically, they took the money to the bank, uh, is how, how he um, explains this. And uh, that pushed the banks to um, find, uh, basically, um, assets uh, that would yield returns. And because they were banks, they did that by lending more to the corporate sector. Um, and uh, as a result, banks acquired what Hilfing called a permanent interest in corporations. You see how that's quite similar to an equity stake, um, uh, except that it was debt, of course. In other words, they lost the exit options uh, in today's, in, in, in um, Hirschman parlance, they lost the exit option. And as a result, they faced the problem of control, as uh, finance always does when, when they become uh, enmeshed with, with industrial capital. Um, and so corporations had to be closely watched and cont uh, be controlled by the bank. These are all quotes. Now, in the US and in Germany, banks' role in corporate governance, uh, as we would today call this, um, was basically geared towards minimizing competition, maximizing profits, and thus the ability of corporations to service their debts. Um, you can think of this debt servicing capacity as, as the, uh, uh, as the, as uh, the finest capital version of shareholder value. So in short, there are many parallels between asset manager capitalism and, and finance capital. Others have pointed this out, um, including Jerry Davis, actually already in a paper 15 years ago, and very recently in a very interesting paper by um, Maher and Aquano. Um, but of course, the financial institutions that we're talking about then were banks, whereas the financial institutions we're talking about today are asset managers. So what are these asset managers, just to bring everyone on the same page uh, before I start talking about um, the rise of control. I mean, it's important to um, understand where asset managers are in the uh, financial system and specifically in the equity investment chain, which I'm showing you here. Um, and essentially what happened over the last 70 years is that um, new financial intermediaries emerged uh, that have made the investment chain, the equity investment chain, longer. Um, first, you had the rise of institutional investors, first and foremost, pension funds, um, which then, started, starting in the 1980s, uh, increasingly delegated the management of uh, their assets to external um, asset managers, which are... Uh, uh, and these two are fundamentally different actors. Pension funds are sort of not-for-profit institutions, capital pools that pool capital for households and the beneficial owners are the households. Um, and of course, there are people working at these pension funds and they need to be paid, but uh, they're not for-profit actors in the way that commercial asset managers are for-profit actors um, that operate on a fee-based business model. Um, so these actors are quite different uh, and uh, it's... That's one difference, and the other difference is that these are capital pools that pool the capital of households, and these are capital pools, the asset managers, that pool the capital of households and institutional investors. So as the investment chain got longer, capital pools got larger. Um, and so that's why institutional investors, the biggest pension funds at the peak of pension fund capitalism, uh, CalPERS, the California Public Pension Fund, for example, held like a maximum of about 1% in any given large U.S. corporation, whereas today, today uh, the asset managers, you know, they hold up to 10% in, um, in, in many l large U.S. companies. Um, so that's, that's the picture here. And here uh, you can see uh, from a recent paper uh, by uh, these authors here, it's on SSRN, uh, like the, the magnitude of this phenomenon uh, for the U.S., uh, the three largest asset managers taken together hold almost one quarter of the shares of the largest of the average company in the in the S&P 500, which is very very significant, um, especially given that 
in the comparative or in the in the corporate governance literature and also therefore in the comparative political economy literature it's always taken as a as a sort of axiom that uh, the US uh, as well as the UK but the US even more are a dispersed ownership society um, and uh, th this certainly uh, is currently no longer no longer the case um, at least as with regard to institutional shareholdings, the U.S. is the most uh, concentrated uh, system. But of course, uh, share ownership by individuals is still uh, very strong in, in many, <coughs> many economies. Now here I'm uh, showing you a picture for the uh, U.K. from a paper I wrote with uh, Adrian, who is right here, um, on, that shows you the uh, FTSE 100 companies. You can't see the names, but these are all the FTSE 100 companies. and. You can see um, the shareholdings of BlackRock, Legal and General, and Vanguard, the largest uh, shareholders in, in the UK. Um, and uh, well, basically the only the, the only you can see they are fully diversified. They hold all the share uh, all, all the companies um, with some variation, but uh, pretty much uh, these are straight lines. So depending on how large the capital pool is, that determines how large the shareholdings in individual companies are. Um, and uh, yeah, the UK is slightly behind the US uh, in terms of the combined holdings of the, of the largest three asset managers. And this looks similar in Germany too, and increasingly in, in other countries too. Um, <clears throat> okay, so, uh, so much for the numbers. Like, uh, now, what, uh, what does it all mean? Uh, for for uh, asset manager capitalism as a, as a corporate governance regime. Here I'm showing you a table that um, uh, is from this paper, which uh, was already published last year, and where I try to make sense of the evolution of, of sh corporate governance regimes in the U.S. over time. So you can, it's a stylized version of the evolution of the corporate govern of corporate governance regimes, but you can very much read this from left to right um, as a, um, yeah, as they developed historically. Um, and what you see is the evolution of the corporate governance regime from a high concentration configuration, finance capital, which ended uh, basically in the early 20th century um, to, again, a high concentration configuration today. And in between, uh, there was a period in the middle decades of the 20th century when shareholdings were much more dispersed among households. Uh, uh, so that's uh, the, the period usually described as managerialism, when there were no um, institutional capital pools to speak of. Um, and that was really the Burley and Means version of, uh, of the U.S. as a dispersed ownership society, even though, of course, there is actually um, quite a bit of empirical work by economic historians uh, that shows that even though households own all the equity, um, shareholdings were still quite concentrated. And the reason, of course, is that uh, even though inequality was lower, it was still very high. And then that uh, concentration of shareholdings was uh, uh, exacerbated uh, by um, other ways of maintaining control, which is then, which is what the literature on cor corporate interlock networks uh, showed for the time. But anyway, there were no institutional capital pools, and then you had uh, the rise of pension funds, which brought about or which were major actors in bringing about the shareholder primacy regime. Now, the shareholder primacy regime uh, is interesting. Uh, because, as I just said, these pension funds, they were just small enough to make exit a credible threat. They could sell individual stakes. They were not invested in all companies, and their stakes were small enough to make, to make uh, exit a credible threat. And at the same time, they were large enough, and they were the, the largest uh, individual, uh, institutional shareholders, to make their voice uh, carry weight in corporate governance. So, it was, um, as John Coffey put it in a, in a classic article from 1991, um, it was uh, a sweet spot. Uh, they, could, they had the capacity to unite liquidity and control, uh, which made these shareholders quite powerful, even though they held only small shares. 
Um, uh, today, uh, this exit option is lost for the, the most powerful shareholders today. De facto do not have this exit option, first, because you cannot sell a stake in a company that uh, where you hold 10% without massive uh, losses to the share price. So th that is one reason, illiquidity. Um, and another reason is, of course, that uh, BlackRock, State Street, and Vanguard, the big three asset managers, most of their equity, most of their shareholdings are via uh, index tracking funds. So um, if you hold, uh, if you are invested in a BlackRock ETF, you can decide to sell uh, your shares in that ETF, and then BlackRock would reduce its holdings of stock. Um, but you cannot tell BlackRock to t sell individual uh, stocks that are in that ETF, nor can BlackRock decide to do that. So that's the second reason why the exit option uh, is really um, is really gone there, and that raises all sorts of very interesting questions. Uh, because control-based power is high, 10% is a lot. 25% for the big three is even more. And then, you know, there are more asset managers with an identical business model and with identical clients, therefore with supposedly identical interests. And so you have uh, 30, 40, uh, sometimes even more uh, percent of the shares are held by uh, these asset managers with support, with, uh, yeah, very much the same interests. Uh, but what do they do with this with this um, power? That's the question I want to turn to now in the remaining, uh, I guess, 15, 15 minutes. Um, given their considerable control-based power in corporate governance, what do BlackRock and Vanguard use it for? Um, and the question I want to focus on is, in a way, the yeah, what I think is the most important question here, and certainly the question that has been most discussed recently in the literature, uh, which is the the great promise of asset manager capitalism, the the promise of universal ownership. Um, so, what does this mean? Uh, well, given the very high degree of diversification of these asset managers, um, this means that today's dominant shareholders are invested across almost the entire economy. Um, and so these universal owners should, in principle, take the long view and uh, seek to curb the negative externalities that arise from the conduct of the individual corporations in their portfolios. Um, and the main example here um, are, of course, uh, greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, which really have uh, consequences for um, each and every single company that is in the portfolio. Um, and certainly, uh, BlackRock has very much positioned itself over the years as a long-term investor. So I uh, just collected a few quotes from over the years here. Um, and they have a point. They are long-term investors. Um, so after, but after a decade of, of you know, BlackRock being the most uh, single uh, largest shareholder in most companies in the U.S. and elsewhere, uh, what sh we can already ask, what should be our preliminary verdict on, on the universal owner hypothesis? And I think there we can be quite clear, uh, and at least I know that at least Adrian would, would agree with this uh, verdict. Uh, which is that, as an empirical proposition, I think we have to reject this universal ownership hypothesis. Um, the big three could have done a lot uh, in recent years in terms of pushing companies to decarbonize, invest in green tech, um, change their business model, and so on. But they have done almost nothing. Um, just let me give you one example that the main point of the paper is not to prove this, um, yeah, uh, because I, I, I think the fact, it, it's quite clear. Um, and this is one quite powerful example from a recent report by uh, ShareAction, uh, which uh, they did a study of 146 shareholder resolutions related to environmental and social issues. Uh, and uh, in the 2021 proxy season, so when shareholders vote on these shareholder proposals, 
uh, and they uh, looked at how many of these shareholder resolutions different um, shareholders supported, and from 100% down to almost nothing. And I marked the big three, uh, BlackRock, State Street, and Vanguard in yellow. That's all you need to see. And you can see that they supported a very small number, and they are at the least supportive end of the spectrum of shareholders. Um, so they are more likely than almost all their peers to vote against those shareholder re resolutions. Um, this is true for the next three as well, so the, the biggest six uh, asset managers. And they voted even, uh, they uh, supported fewer resolutions than recommended by the two leading, leading proxy advisory firms, ISS and Glass-Lewis, uh, uh, which recommended supporting about 45 in the case of Glass-Lewis percent of proposals and 75 in the case of ISS. Um, so um, this, is, this is quite uh, uh, an impressive data point, I would think, in this regard. Of course, there is the argument um, that these big asset managers engage uh, behind closed doors and don't need to vote. Um, but yeah, I, I have yet to see uh, evidence of, of this uh, making any sort of, uh, of impact. Now, the catch is, uh, oh, why is this? Um, and uh, there are a lot of int conflicts of interest. Uh, the interests of asset managers are not necessarily aligned with those of the asset owners, the pension funds, and eventually, uh, ultimately, the households who are the beneficial owners um, of all these investments. I've listed the main conflicts of interest um, around which the, the political economy of, of asset manager capitalism revolves. Uh, conflicts one to four are quite well documented in the literature, and uh, I discuss each of them in, in the chapter that, um, that I took this table from. Um, and here I really want to focus on the fifth, uh, which is politics, like, uh, and politics as in legislation and, uh, and regulation. Um, so the argument here is that control-based power, um, in theory, in theory, is a more direct form and more powerful form of financial sector power than exit-based power. Um, however, it is also a lot more visible uh, and therefore more easily contested and politicized. And um, in a way, these asset managers are too big to escape politics. So um, uh, if there is, if there is a... In the absence of a, a substantial or robust political majority in favor of them acting as universal owners, they are unlikely to do that, is basically, is basically the argument. And I, I will show you some, some evidence that basically from uh, the uh, financial news uh, of 2022 to uh, support, support this argument. Um, and again, this is, is about the US, where all of this plays out, because all of these firms are US firms. And it's interesting, and Larry Fink is on record, uh, basically, or uh, saying that. Um, and, and he says that uh, we're now as likely to be uh, attacked uh, by Democrats and by Republicans, so we must be doing something right. Uh, which is, of course, uh, a little bit silly, but uh, he has a point. It's true. Um, and Democrats criticize the ongoing perpetuation uh, of, um, of the shareholder value regime and its just distributional outcomes, the perpetuation of inequality through, uh, uh, as you saw, uh, ever-growing share buybacks, and the lack of green engagement in voting. Republicans do the opposite. It's a quote from Ted Cruz, for example, mm -hmm. from, um, from this year. Um, and many of you reading the Financial Times or, or, or another newspaper probably uh, have seen that there is pretty much a concerted campaign uh, by Republicans against large asset managers uh, under the uh, uh, crazy banner of woke capital. Um, so what is happening there? Uh, the most high-profile, I think, legislative um, thing going on is uh, the Investor Democracy is Expected, or INDEX Act, introduced in May 2020, 2022 uh, by 10, I um, know if you are than 10 Republican senators, 
Um, and it uh, would require index tracking asset managers holding more than 1% of a listed company's shares to vote shares in, according to each uh, individual investor's instructions, which would be a massive uh, requirement um, uh, and probably impossible to implement uh, uh, at this point, and therefore probably won't happen. And then, um, so this is regulation. This would this is what a regulatory backlash uh, could uh, look like, um, short of actually breaking up these large asset managers. This this would be, well, uh, it, it wouldn't be a breakup, but it, it would be uh, very close to something like that. Um, and then there is, of course, the threat of uh, withdrawing funds from individual asset managers. And the people who can do that are basically... Uh, elected officials at the state level in red states, in Republican states. Uh, and they have been doing so to the tune of now over, well over one billion, which of course is peanuts uh, still for, um, for BlackRock. This is specifically for BlackRock. Um, but it is, um, it is not trivial. So, um, We can also observe very significant rear guard action, um, or rear guard, uh, BlackRock and Vanguard putting up a rear guard fight um, against, against these attacks. They have reacted to this already and taking this very seriously. So in the context of, of the paper, what, what, uh, what my argument there is, is that uh, in order to understand why universal owners are not acting as universal owners. It's not enough to look at corporate governance through the lens of an interaction between shareholders and managers, uh, which is, at least since the uh, intellectual victory of agency theory, how corporate governance scholarship has looked at this. Uh, their managers and their shareholders, and there's a struggle between them, and. Um, Basically, shareholders have managed to align the interests of managers with their interests. Um, and so that's, that's, that's how we uh, should analyze this landscape. Um, but my argument is that this misses out a lot of what is more important than corporate governance for asset managers. These are for-profit companies that want to manage as much money as possible uh, and uh, have uh, costs that are as low as possible. And the major main cost factor is regulation. So all the due diligence uh, and so on they have to do. Uh, the monitoring uh, they are forced to do of individual companies, the processing of ESG data and so on and so forth. Um, the collecting of individual uh, investor voting intentions, this would all be extremely expensive for them. So there is this hierarchy of priorities managing maximizing assets under management, avoiding regulatory backlash, and then do corporate governance. Um, um, and so that's why I think it is uh, important to step out of this straitjacket of, of the corporate governance uh, framework and to take very seriously these political processes that arise once you have shareholders that are that big that they basically um, make the front page news and become you know, they, they cannot escape. There is a conflict uh, in Congress playing out at the highest level of politics uh, in the U.S. You know, Bernie Sanders, Ted Cruz, the most prominent people uh, speaking out uh, on uh, these issues um, uh, because this is, yeah, essentially about, uh, well, the future of fossil fuels in the U.S. economy and so on. Uh, and, and these companies, these asset managers are too big uh, to escape those politics. So what have they been doing? Vanguard has announced it, its intention recently to continue investing in fossil fuel industries because climate change was only, quote, one factor in an investment decision. Uh, BlackRock, um, in, its Larry Fink, in his latest letter to CEOs, which he sends every year, said that stakeholder capitalism that BlackRock has been advocating was neither a social nor an ideolog ideological agenda, nor woke. What? Uh, he does not want to be the environmental police. Uh, the, he's, they said that the climate-related proposals made for 2022 uh, were overly prescriptive and not consistent with our clients' uh, long-term financial interests. 
And in fact, they followed up through with this announcement, which they had made before voting. Um, and uh, um, this proxy season actually supported only, yeah, they, they slashed their support, support for shareholder proposals on environmental and social issues by half. Um, another, um, yes. Uh, almost done. Another smoking gun piece of evidence is that BlackRock's proxy voting is uh, can be found in the regional variation uh, in its voting behavior. Basically, they're supporting ESG uh, proposals in Europe, and they're overwhelmingly opposing in in North America, which is uh, really a st very striking data point. Um, and then there is BlackRock's very uh, transparent um, attempt to preempt um, this regulatory political backlash. Uh, already in 2021, they announced a pilot project to allow institutional investors in the US and UK the option to decide themselves how their proxy votes should be cast. The program is called Voting Choice. Uh, that pro uh, has uh, since been expanded. And um, I just yesterday, and it didn't make it in the presentation anymore, saw four tweets by BlackRock, a mini threat that basically started with, you know, this whole problem uh, of the political quagmire they're in, and then uh, the last two tweets were dedicated to uh, promoting their voter choice, voting choice program. So it's clearly in their mind uh, also related, uh, related to these uh, political risks. Um, so to sum up, asset managers currently are in the US are trying to perform as much environmental and social stewardship as necessary to appease progressives while saying and doing as little as possible that could be weaponized by Republicans. Needless to say, that is trying to square the circle. It's not really possible, uh, which is why I think um, it's important to recognize that what is playing out there is not some sort of corporate governance problem, but it's simply the uh, the, uh, the politics uh, that is playing out in the US political economy at the moment, or yeah, in this era. OK, um, <clears throat> conclusion, um, finance capital is back. Uh, control is stronger in theory than exit, but in practice is more visible and politicized. Um, Therefore, universal ownership theory does not map onto what could be called actually existing asset manager capitalism, um, where politics um, and fear of regulatory backlash is more important um, than what you can achieve through careful stewardship at the level of the individual portfolio company. Always thinking from the profit motive of the individual asset manager. Um, and so, from this perspective, asset manager capitalism is really a corporate governance regime that is in crisis, and um, there is a strong, I think, um, it, it's pretty clear that there is a need to think about uh, alternatives uh, to, in terms of yeah, corporate ownership, corporate governance, and so on, which maybe we can do during the discussion. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, that was a, a fascinating uh, tour of the, a very important field that many people are probably less familiar with. Um, just as, a, as an aside, um, yesterday the um, BlackRock reported back to the UK's Environmental Audit Committee um, who had asked them to respond um, as to how they would balance retiring fossil fuel assets with assuring the UK's energy security given the pivotal role of, finance, of the finance sector in reaching the UK's environmental goals and their response was BlackRock's role in the transition is as a fiduciary to our clients it is not to engineer a specific decarbonisation outcome in the real economy um, so they obviously see themselves somehow outside the uh, the actual decarbonisation process um, so but without further ado I'll ask Olga to um, do an initial response to sort of open up the uh, the field. Thanks, Olga. Well, with great pleasure. Thanks, thanks, Josh. Thanks, Ben, very much uh, for uh, giving me the opportunity to um, 
have a reading and it was really intellectually stimulating, took me out of my comfort zone of the debate that you build on, the more classical state versus global finance. So this is this uh, way more nuanced and goes into the notion of structure power. So it was very intellectually stimulating and a great start of academic year. <laughs> um, uh, I also found it's, it, it's a thick narrative linking evolution of asset managers, institution of a particular form of control uh, over non-financial economy in which exists within financialist capitalism. Um, and um, I want, I actually prepared like a summary, but I don't think I need this because you, you, your summary was really great. And I just want to say that from a reader's perspective, what I found very nice is the fluidity of how you go between you identify a theory and concepts that you work with, and then you go to empirics and say, we have to revisit. So uh, this elegantly also uh, makes it really quite nice. Um, I have one comment and, and um, four questions. And the comment is about a reference to Hilferding and, and Marx, which, which is great. Um, and, and very appropriate, um, although to me it became a bit more clear towards the end of the article. Again, my, I feel like my comments makes less sense because it was already published. <laughs> no, but, I, but, will, I will keep. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, my subjectivity is of course interesting, critical, political, but, but, but um, there is the notion of um, how financial structures um, affect organization of non-financial uh, mm -hmm. sector mm -hmm. and and I just my comment was that I wish it would have come out a bit stronger mm -hmm. at mm -hmm. the very start because my reading of Hilfering was for my own work some time ago during PhD was that oh he's so much focused on the links between you know productive production and finance but thank you for reminding and translating it because it was for me quite rewarding to read that, well, actually there is a relevance precisely because he mm -hmm. says that there is a way how finance can control organization. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, so to sum up, I think it can be even made in stronger mm -hmm. terms. Mm -hmm. You know, this in the grand scheme of mm -hmm. things, there is this relevance. Then my first question would be, um, and my questions were more, as I think told you earlier, they were more in terms of that reading inspired me to link and ask more open-ended mm -hmm. questions mm -hmm. rather than comment specifically, so I hope you don't mind. Um, so when, when, when we talk about, or what I hear, conversation about money or asset managers overall, I am, um, yeah, I, I recall Minsky and Michel Agleta, uh, of course, mm -hmm. and they come to mind in particular the notion of momentum, mm -hmm. which characterizes finance, mm -hmm. and therefore there are cycles, right? Um, and I wonder, is there a space for those cycles in, in, what, in your narrative, in, in that, um, mm -hmm. is there a crisis there in, mm -hmm. in what you are explaining? How does it look in terms of structural power is it does this structural power just constantly gets reinvented mm -hmm. um so it's very adaptive or even reinforced or otherwise so just very open-ended i was just mm -hmm. thinking about that um well since we are an institute of public purpose i couldn't escape asking about the state <laughs> and regulation right um which which you talk also towards the end uh, of the paper you know saying that well this is the politics this is the 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 um, the when the stakes are high um and it relates a little bit to my previous question the state usually comes in at the crisis times in and only after that, of course, we know whether it was successful or not. But, but there is overall notion. And, um, and then he, there, I think of parts of the states that act, act ex, actually as guardians mm -hmm. of broader microeconomic regimes, you know, going to Daniel as Gabor as, as a reference. So I wonder what... Is there any connection of that in what you are saying in the paper? And do they even help solidify 
even the loyalty, which I, I go back to Hirschman's book, whether there is, there is space for that between asset managers and their domestic governments, for example. Um, the next question is about exit power, exit-based power. Uh, that you talk at the beginning, and, and I think you focus more on the control-based power. And, and I just, um, as I read it, the exit-based power, you define that, well, there's just no alternative. It's fairly simple. It's not as dynamic as a control-based power. Mm -hmm. um, and and um, that led me to think, um, what about... What about uh, using, in reality, using exit as a negotiation because, be, you know, between the global finance and, and, and certain and governments, again, going back to the notion of a state and regulation, um, because there are still, asset managers are still business firms themselves. They are registered in certain jurisdictions mm -hmm. for a reason. Mm -hmm. They are also dependent on all the range of uh, services, especially legal functions, right? Uh, and it's not accidental, so how mobile they are in terms of changing. So that's what I meant. Is exit is really just so simple, uh, mm -hmm. or there is no alternative. And finally, one um, is about climate um, and sustainability question. Um, at the beginning of the paper, you talk about functions of capital. There is financing function, and there is also wealth preservation, a well-sustaining mm -hmm. function, right? Um, and I wonder, the way we talk about climate finance, not we in the room, but in general, the discourse, is almost like uh, there is a, uh, the finance has a function, has a climate function. <laughs> and if so, what is it? Um, or is it, is it still the financing of, or what is that? I mean, it just, yeah. Um, Thanks. That that were my maybe we could. I thought that these themes maybe could help us talk um, and link this paper and this work that you presented, which is really great, with other areas of work that you are working on now or um, yeah have been working on. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. Uh, thanks very much, Olga. Do you want to have an initial response to any of those points, Ben? Or As you prefer. Okay. Well, up to you, really. I mean. Maybe just the first point around the, the, yeah. the cycles, perhaps, yeah. the Minsky cycles. Okay. Thank you so much, Olga. These are really excellent questions, and uh, uh, we could easily just fill the remaining half hour. So I, I really uh, will try to be brief, and we uh, talk more later, because, yeah, all four questions are excellent. And uh, Josh wants to hear something about the Aglieta Minsky cycle question, and I think it's a very interesting one. And I have actually a little passage in the paper on Anvieta, right, uh, who uh, basically the French regulation school is where the Hilfeling understanding of the financial system, I think, stayed al alive. Um, like the idea that there is a, a sort of structural uh, tendency in capitalism for, towards financial concentration, right, and therefore, uh, and with greater financial concentration comes greater control um, uh, of finance, um, of non-financial, basically, industrial assets. Mm. And the only difference was that uh, what uh, when um, in the Agueta book, which is from the 70s, history of the basically US economy and financial system, he looked at the financial system and still he saw banks as the main actors. Uh, there and um, he mentioned institutions of contractual saving, uh, by which he meant like uh, basically uh, um, uh, real money or whatever, uh, institutional capital pools, pension funds mostly at, at the time. Um, but of course, they were very small, and no one, I think, no one at the time could imagine uh, how big uh, these institutional capital pools would become. Um, uh, there's also somewhere an am amazing quote from, I think, Means or Bur Burley, uh, probably, uh, from as late as the early late 50s or early 60s, where it's clear that they think, oh, uh, they're saying and pension funds have become so huge 
<laughs> and you can barely see them in a chart if you now look at those years. Um, so, uh, um, there, if the, there are cycles, I would say, of financial concentration, and even is an interesting point that uh, you know the financialization literature uh, it usually is about the latest cycle since the 1970s. Krippner and you know, the entire literature is usually the time frame is uh, is the last 50 years. But of course, Krippner actually mentions Arrighi very prominently, and uh, uh, Arrighi has this theory of repeated uh, cycles that. Uh, Basically, at the end of hegemonic cycles in world history, there is a period of stagnation and financialization. Um, and so I think that is very interesting from, from this, this perspective, is that uh, um, you, you have this period where basically uh, wealth is being concentrated, is accumulated, a long period of wealth accumulation, and uh, somehow ends up, ends up in the hands of financial institutions. Um, and uh, these are now the asset managers. And of course, according to Arigi, that comes, uh, this is associated with stagnation. And we have stagnation. And, and so it, it all works out pretty impressively, I would say. I, I, can, I think Arigi is more helpful there to me than Minsky, but I don't, Minsky so, don't know Minsky so, so well. But, I never. Um, I, I think the, his notion of money manager capitalism. Right, it's it's much more about it's about the money market. He's a money market guy, uh, and this is very much I think a capital market story. Um, so Arigi, I find I find him uh, more helpful. Just one comment on the second question: state as the state as guardian of financial of of of, of regimes. I think this is extremely important. Um, and uh, if you look at where BlackRock is lobbying, you will always find two things. Monetary policy, because the interest rate is the single most important uh, determinant of asset prices, including stock prices, um, and uh, uh, pension policy. So without funded pensions, BlackRock would be nothing. Mm -hmm. This is uh, the, the growth of asset, manager, asset managers is the growth of... Uh, um, funded pensions uh, in the US, in the UK, in the Netherlands, um, and uh, Australia, Canada, and basically that's it. Um, <laughs> so, uh, yeah, that, the, and um, <coughs> that's, that's the lever the state can pull uh, in either direction, and it's the greatest interest, of course, for these firms that uh, there will be more funded pensions also in other countries. And the greatest threat is a return to a pay-go system, which uh, I've been writing in favor of and <laughs> in another paper. So I wonder if they have a file at this point. Pay-go being like uh, defined benefits? Uh, no, pay-go being uh, you all, we all pay into a pot, uh, pay, uh, you know, levy to the government and uh, the government pay just moves that money on to our parents' and grandparents' pockets with no financial intermediation at all. Yeah. Uh, because defined uh, benefits can still be pre-funded, right. but I mean not, not funded, pay as you go, mm. in that sense, uh, without, without any need for financial intermediation, Great. which is how we do it in Germany, for example, mostly. But they're pushing for a funded pillar, <laughs> so... Uh, okay. yeah. Well, we've had a great example, I think, of how... Um, BlackRock is trying to influence yes. <laughs> uh, pensions policy uh, over here uh, recently. Um, Rupert Harrison's just been appointed to the Chancellor's uh, <coughs> uh, Council of Advisors, um, who not only is a black, works for BlackRock, but also is the architect of the austerity regime. Anyway, um, with, on that note, I want to get some questions from the audience. Um, if you could raise your hand, just say who, who you are. I'll, I'll take two or three at a a time. Yeah, Stefan. Just uh, right away. Hi, how you doing? I'm Stefan. I'm doing my PhD with Josh on land rents and sustainability, and my question is related to that as well. I wonder if you brought the idea of asset, um, 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 asset manager capitalism closer, or formally or informally, to the idea of rentier capitalism, mm -hmm. um, because it seems like the first, the, one of the early charts on, on equity mostly being a pull on 
on, on funding rather than a push to like new funding. And, and also the idea of, of not having an exit, as, uh, not, not having an exit seems, seems very close. The idea of universal ownership mm -hmm. of the, say, U.S. economy, mm -hmm. it's almost like that's sort of the scarce asset. You can't, it's only one U.S. economy. Mm -hmm. It seems to be yeah. like a lot of parallels with the idea of, of rents and, and also the, the, the lack of interest in, mm -hmm. in, 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 these, um, in the operations, that you're essentially just interested in the actual return. So. Okay, any more? Also from Katie. online, yeah. I'll, I'll do um, two because they're kind of quite closely linked. Um, so I've got one question from um, Fergus Green. Uh, he says, um, you say that universal ownership is about taking the long view, but isn't the time horizon a separate issue from their incentives for internalisation of externalities? Mm -hmm. In theory, couldn't these asset managers have strong incentives to internalise externalities? Um, i.e. universal owner incentives could be operative, but also have incentives to do that on a short-term basis only. Mm -hmm. Can the behaviour, for example, on climate change of these investors then not be better explained by the long-term nature of climate change and its incongruence with short-term incentives in stock markets? Uh, and then Craig Berry has uh, also asked a question on time horizons. He says... Um, uh, my question is whether institutional investors could again adopt a longer term perspective on corporate governance if divorced from reliance on asset managers. Mm -hmm. Some would argue that in-house investment management exhibits similar practices to the big three anyway, so democratising intermediation would not in itself challenge this culture. Right, thank you, Katie. That's, uh, <laughs> uh, some fairly substantial questions there. Uh, so, so Ben, over to you. You can go in any order you want on those on those three. Uh, so, Stefan was yes. rentier capitalism, yes. Fergus universal ownership, Craig. Yeah. One. Okay, great. Uh, yeah, as you say, not easy questions at all. Mm -hmm. um, so, on the rentier capitalism, I, I, um, there is a conference soon, uh, also in London. Uh, all the exciting stuff is in London, um, <laughs> where I uh, will present a version of this also, and it's on empty uh, capitalism. And so, so I will have to think about this more. And I, I completely agree with you that there are many parallels, and uh, in a way, this uh, one institutional sort of adapt or manifestation of uh, rentier capitalism, um, because basically, one way of understanding the rise of the big three asset managers is, you know, is a, to give uh, rentiers, uh, in a way, a cheap exposure to these assets you know, without taking too big of a cut themselves. Because um, investing in equity used via mutual funds used to be uh, extremely expensive. And it was very lucrative to be a mutual fund manager and, you know, to, like, pretend to be uh, the best stock picker on Wall Street uh, when really, you know, you lose half of the time because you have to. Um, uh, and so in, in a way, um, it's, it's an improvement, a great improvement from around here perspective <laughs> to have the asset management industry because not only have you got a cheap, uh, a cheap vehicle for exposure to the listed universe, you also have specialized private equity funds who can give you exposure to uh, unlisted equity and even, even exposure to uh, housing, mm -hmm. um, which is where a private equity has moved, of course. Um, and still, you retain substantial liquidity as an uh, as a investor. You can have exposure to all of these. Um, and that, from a volunteer perspective, is asset manager capitalism is really a great thing. Uh, I, I would say. Um, and of course there is a cost. Yeah, you know, so have a good life as an asset manager usually. Uh, as uh, all of you of course know, uh, living in London, looking around. Um, then, yes, Fergus's question on universal oh, Ownership not being the same as long-term orientation. Uh, it's, uh, I commend Fergus for uh, having a very good look at this slide, uh, where I was aware uh, opposing. Uh, you know, it was I should have found 
uh, quotes by uh, Larry Fink where he said that he was a universal owner. Um, but I had all these quotes on the long term, um, on the long term orientation, so I left left them on there. Um, but of course, this is correct. It's it's not it's not the same thing. Uh, although I would say, from if you are a long term uh, investor, then you have, and you are fully diversified, then um, the, then you need to, uh, in theory. Uh, take these a negative external effects that arise from the conduct of individual companies in your portfolio uh, on the stock price on all the other companies in the portfolio, you need to take that into account. How you can take that into account, and I think what the question is, 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 the, only, is the main reason why asset managers are not doing that because they are operating on the short-term logic of the, of the stock market. And so... Then, if that's the question, then it would link quite direct. It would be similar to Craig's question, which is that would we be in a better world, you know, if we cut out the yes asset managers from the investment chain, and return all the, basically, uh, have only the the asset owners, the institutional investors, and and return power to them, which, you know, if 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 you cut out this middleman, then yes, then. Uh, uh, the institutional investors would be in charge a lot more again. And uh, they are the ones that have a long-term perspective, um, not only because they are, don't have an exit option in the way the asset managers do, but also because they don't, they don't have, as I said, a commercial uh, for-profit logic that governs them. They are just fiduciaries for pensioners who should have a fairly long-term view. So... Um, I do think that on the spectrum between, uh, it, it, in my reading of the evolution of pension fund capitalism, uh, the, mo the latest stage where pension funds invest via third party commercial asset managers is worse, uh, is more financialized, more short term, uh, more misaligned incentives, of course, than uh, uh, the previous stage where. Um, at least as far as public equity is concerned, um, often these large pension funds would invest directly. And you can even see that now, I mean, some of the, uh, I'm not an expert, Craig knows this much better how it works in, in the UK, but some of the Dutch pension funds, the large ones, uh, do their own investment or even their own asset manager. So they, they try to do this, cutting out of the middlemen, and I think there is uh, value to that. Uh, the reason why many pension funds don't do that, and the reason why historically in the US they stopped operating like that and started delegating to external asset managers was of course the ERISA legislation in the 70s and, and legal liability reasons for pension fund trustees uh, were incentivized to cover their backs by delegating to professional asset managers so that they can't make mistakes that they can be sued for. Um, and, and that, of course, is a problem. So one could think of, I think there is some uh, movement towards consolidation in the British uh, in, um, pension fund sector to have fewer, larger funds. This, in Germany, sometimes this is described as the Swedish model. There is maybe some value in that, um, but overall, uh, um, I think that the 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 best case world uh, from a, let's say green industrial policy uh, perspective, where you have pinch, patient pension fund capital that can be deployed strategically by. You know, democratic decision of either voters or just pension fund beneficiaries, which is a subset of voters, um, the upper 50%. Um, in order to have that, you need to fundamentally uh, re-regulate the financial system because as long as you have pension funds and as long as you have pensioners who depend on the return that these pension funds make for their old age income, you have a strong structural tendency towards maximizing returns 
on an annual basis because how else are you going to measure it? Uh, and uh, you know, beneficiaries want to see uh, those returns year by year. And so his, there's a reason why historically uh, pension funds have moved into ever more financialized forms of investment and into from public assets to private assets to uh, private equity and hedge funds nowadays because there is a structural reason to push up r returns which have to be measured for accountability reasons in the short term. If you make it so that uh, they can only invest in public ish, uh, securities issued by public developments, banks, and so on, then you would have changed something. But that, mm. you know, this is a big... Okay. Thanks. Uh, yeah, good question, Emma. Um, thanks, Ben. It was a great, uh, great presentation. Um, yeah. I guess you maybe ask sort of like two parts to it. I, I think the first part is sort of just what, as I was looking through, you know, hearing you and hearing the last bit and, and the focus on sort of green politics. I wonder, and you kind of, you know, um, talked about this in your answer to the first question, what, you know, about the sort of ultimate political goal of asset managers. Um, because going back to, you know, what, like this kind of, this form of finance, uh, you know, I think if you have these kind of universal owners, they're effectively interested in the profit share in the economy as a whole going up, rather than the profitability, right, we know this, rather than the profitability of an individual enterprise. Whereas if you have more dispersed shareholding that's, you know, less concentrated and more in individual firms, you're, you know, you're interested in your profits, not the profit share of the entire mm -hmm. economy. And as we know, this is sort of, you know, coalesced with the sort of accumulation regime that we've had since the 80s, which has been one of sort of low investment, Low productivity, rising profit share. So your, you know, your 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 profitability is based on redistribution right. rather than on sort of capitalist dynamism. Um, so I wonder if it, like if the political is the political goal, and you sort of gestured at this by saying you know they're interested in pension regulations, like the ESG stuff, in a way is a way of kind of you know satisfying the European regulator or, or you know not regular European political class or U.S. political class, just sort of towing this fine line where they're ultimately interested in pension regulations, um, you know, interest, the, the rate of interest. Um, I wonder if you could say a bit more about what the sort of ultimate underlying political goal is. Like, is the political goal more the maintenance of this kind of regime of accumulation, where you're able to maintain, you know, basically maintain a kind of low productivity, high redistribution upwards economy, um, and be sort of happy with it? And I guess the derivative second question that could you have this model of financial ownership um, under a different sort of regime of accumulation and that kind of role of the state and what you know what that would actually look like? Is it basically bounded to this kind of form? Okay, then do you just give us your name? Sorry. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Any other questions from the audience? Um, yeah, over there. Uh, my name is Hugo. Hi, right, Hugo. Mm -hmm. um, it would be interesting to, to hear your thoughts on the, a bit more about kind of ESG or the, the, the tendency for asset managers to try and solve these problems through launching products that are uh, explicitly marketed anyway as trying to incorporate considerations around climate or corporate governance or, or social good. Um, and I assume, given it wasn't mentioned in your speech, you, you don't think that that's a solution to the problem that you outline, and it would be interesting to understand why sort of your view of the, the shortcomings of that as a solution, if that is indeed your, your view. Okay, thanks. Katie? Yeah, I've got another one from online, um, from Alex uh, Kalinikos. Mm -hmm. um, he provocatively says, um, is exit not looking alive and kicking if we witness the continuing uh, problems going on with guilts? Um, mm -hmm. This is particularly interesting because one key aspect of this whole debacle, uh, the liability-driven investment strategy, involves the same kind of actors that you discuss, pension funds versus asset managers. And BlackRock has apparently been a big source of collateral calls. So do you have any thoughts about this? Uh, BlackRock's obviously a big marketer of, of LBI. Yeah, great. Okay, so we'll, we'll, we'll go to those questions, Ben. Um, I would like to just throw in another yeah. 
point which relates to the first question mm -hmm. and that last point, which is a broader point, I suppose, about you know what do this does this new regime of much higher interest rates and inflation yeah. mean for the strategy that you've, yeah. you've outlined the, the regime that you've outlined. Yeah. Thank you, Th thank you all. Um, yeah, maybe just to uh, Josh's last point, uh, BlackRock. Uh, all these asset managers charge fees on uh, the assets they manage. So if your uh, portfolio goes down in value, uh, then you pay less money to these asset managers because 0.1% of you know, 1,000 bucks is less than 0.1% on 2,000 bucks. And uh, so um, their profits go up when share prices go up, and their profits go down when share prices go down. It's uh, their, their revenue, uh, and therefore their profits, because it doesn't really cost what the, the cost difference. There is no cost difference, so um, they just have uh, they're having a very bad year. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this the, but there was an FT article just on the the fall in um, revenues for BlackRock, and um, so this is this is bad. Um, the ultimate goal um, of these asset managers, do they want to maintain uh, the low productivity, high redistribution model? Uh, it's a tricky question because one would think that that's unsustainable model. Um, and so given, you know, again, their long-term outlook in theory, wouldn't they want to contribute to overcoming this model? And, um, well, yeah, I mean, you know, I have actually r uh, just studied, read uh, with an RA all their BlackRock's macro outlooks since 2018, which is like a quarterly, more or less, publication on, on the US, US and world economy. And um, what's interesting, for example, uh, they talk about climate, in, it's a macro report once uh, in relation to something the ECB is doing. Um, so, you know, this out, macro outlook for the investors. They talk about climate a lot elsewhere uh, when it comes to ESG products, for example, but in their main macro publication, which is the publication that they have hired extremely high-end central bankers for, these things are written by the former president of the Swiss Central Bank, and... Uh, and, and uh, former deputy governor of the Bank of Canada, and then they have uh, Stanley Fisher also. Uh, so they hired high-profile central bankers, but they're lobbying on money, or, you know, they, they, they're uh, writing and opinionating and FT op editing on uh, monetary policy, not, not on a new vision for the economy. Um, and so, yes, I don't think um, they are, they're having any ambitions in that regard. Uh, however, when, uh, at the, in the earliest days of the Biden administration, I think there was something like, uh, you know, we're going to fund the Green New Deal from public money. Immediately, uh, there was, there was an, an op-ed, I think it was an op-ed, by, 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 by a BlackRock central banker um, opposing that. You know, not, no, it needs to be private money. Because these are really threatening scenarios. The most threatening scenario is basically, uh, you know, the big green state, um, public investment, uh, financial repression, um, and roping pension funds into financing, you know, public uh, investment projects. That 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 is. Uh, these are threatening. <laughs> Scenarios. Disastrous. Um, <laughs> these are threatening scenarios. And so, if anything, you know, uh, most most transformative scenarios, uh, people in this building and elsewhere would be thinking about. They would not be aligned. I think. I think. <laughs> That's a good thing. <laughs> uh, ESG. Yeah. I. There, you guessed right. <laughs> there was a reason why I didn't talk so much. That was the reason why I didn't talk so much about ESG. Um, in my talk, I don't think it's a very promising, a very promising avenue. And, and again, but the, the deeper reason is that uh, 
these these asset managers are not shapers of the economy. They are trying to manage a lot of money cheaply and without like. Um, pissing off whoever runs the U.S. government too much, uh, to put it, uh, th that's and and so, yeah, ESG has turned out to have been a fraud so far, um, as witnessed by an increasing number of legal proceedings, uh, or t uh, as evidenced by that. Um, so, yeah, I I I, do, I don't have a lot of faith in that. Uh, and and then the is exit um, Alex's question is exit not alive and kicking? Uh, see UK guilds. Yes. So um, uh, this argument about really exit options being down applies first and foremost to I would say uh, U.S. assets, uh, and then safe corporate uh, safe sovereign debt of other countries that, you know, is sovereign debt that financial actors need to hold because it's, uh, we're in a collateral uh, fueled financial system and uh, there's only so much safe government debt and so uh, there's no exit options for holders of German and Japanese and uh, Swiss and US sovereign debt. Uh, there's also no exit option for public equity asset managers when it comes to the U.S. stock market because there's literally nowhere else to go for all this money. Um, but of course, then, as you go down the ladder, the international financial hierarchy, increasingly, exit is very alive and kicking. And you know, I don't want to uh, pursue this uh, thought further. <laughs> um, but, uh, I mean, yes, this, this is a scary scenario that has played out, although, I, of course, also, what has been dr driving this was not so much a rush to the exit of international financial investors, but some LDI-driven disaster, shadow banking disaster, right? Um, so I wouldn't t make too much of it. Um, uh, but just in general, concede the point, yes, exit is very much alive and kicking for a large part of uh, uh, non-financial actors, states and firms in the economy. Uh, it's just that for the home of most of financial investment in the world, which is the U.S., um, uh, it is not. Okay, thanks. We've got time for the last couple of questions. Um, so the lady over here, please. Yeah. Hi, um, thanks for a really great talk, Percy. Um, I'm Ellie. I actually work at Share Action. Mm -hmm. um, oh, great. So You're doing great work. <laughs> um, but um, I have a couple of bits of my question. Um, which are firstly um, on the sort of point about exit not being an option. Um, I suppose, and do you correct me if I've like misunderstood this, but with the sort of growth of the asset management industry in line with the growth of like index fund investing, I suppose, is there any empirical evidence pointing to the fact that, um, I suppose, if the intention was there to be sort of stewards of companies without the threat of investment, but with the sort of legal tools that are available. Is there sort of empirical, empirical evidence saying that without the threat of exit, that is not, wouldn't be effective? Um, or like, has that sort of happened? I hope that makes sense. Um, and then I guess my other part of my question was sort of around pension funds and whether you sort of think that with, say, say we like theoretically had sort of the growth of those sort of um, voting type tools that like BlackRock are bringing in, so more sort of um, instruction from pension funds um, via their sort of beneficiaries um, and say like rewriting of regulation around like fiduciary duties and things like that, do you think, so like if pension funds had the confidence to do that, do you think that would create like enough, enough of a shift to sort of see changes in the real economy or do you think that like it fundamentally needs a yeah repurposing of like the pension system and it's like dependence on growth overall and that's like a massively risky thing to sort of put into place I guess as like those short term policy solutions around like yeah changes in future duty voting instruction to asset managers um, or yeah do you think yes. it's like needs bigger changes to the okay thank you and then the chap at the back there hi yeah um, thanks for your talk I'm Oliver 
Um, I have two quick questions. So first of all, you kind of mentioned uh, why these guys have got so big, and I think you mentioned like the price element. And then the phrase I've kind of heard is like, no one gets fired for allocating to black ops because they're so mm -hmm. big and universal. And I just wonder what you think though the role is for more smaller asset managers, who I think you could argue are more intentional about mm -hmm. how they invest and what they mm -hmm. want to see, and like are there ways that they could be threatened or mm -hmm. helped? And like you've seen um, as like new new formation of businesses in asset management has really kind of declined mm -hmm. in more recent years. And then the second point, I'd be interested to hear you're kind of referencing the kind of the net political networks that some of these asset managers have. Mm -hmm. What do you think their strategy is in emerging markets where in Asia where perhaps a lot of the wealth will be generated in the future and there's a lot of emerging businesses that are going to be very strong in the future. Kind of, what do you think their strategy there, especially is on the government side, given that they might not have the clout that they do in, um, say, in the US? Thank you. Okay, we've got one more. No? Okay, we'll finish with those two then. Or oh, four, actually. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Thanks, Ben. Okay, uh, thank you. Um, we're over time, so I'll try to be uh, brief, but th they're all really good questions. Ellie, right? Um, so, if I understood the first question correct, is, 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 the, is exit the, um, a condition for the effectiveness of engagement? Like, if, if they don't have the ultimate threat of exit, is then also the other, f or other forms of shareholder engagement less, less effective? And... Um, I mean, there is always the vote. The, they have the voting power, which if they are willing to wield it and actually vote against management, then that should be, I think, enough, uh, at least if you know, the big three all uh, do it. So I think control-based power can be quite effective without, without exit if they really wield it aggressively. Um, do pension funds, you know, it, it, would it be enough of a fix um, to return power to pension funds and would they have the competence to, d to deal with that? Um, I, I would be, I'm, I'm very skeptical of this partly because of that's just the structural reason that, the structural reason why there is this delegation is because the stakes are so high and the returns have to be made and just returning, you know, authority to pension funds does not resolve that fundamental problem of um, funded pensions, and in particular, of course, of defined um, benefit pensions, which is not to say that uh, they should be abolished, not at all. It's more um, an argument against funded pensions altogether. Um, and, yeah, I think a bigger, b bigger fix would be needed, and yeah, I can only, again, uh, maybe advertise uh, Adrian and Matthew's book, uh, for example, on, on alternative forms of ownership, asset management, corporate governance, and so on, but it's, it's, <laughs> it's a very big question, but the, cli you know, the c climate policy is also a huge opportunity in this regard, because in a way, in the stagnation, like low growth economy, I mean, for many reasons, artificially, because we, we could have done this for decades, invested in, in green tech. There, there is a, an opportunity to, and a clear uh, reason to restructure the financial system around investment in long term infrastructure, green energy projects, and so on, that will have dividends in you know, 20, 30, 100 years' time. And in principle, this should be something that the pension funds can be roped into, but uh, not, unfortunately, in, within a system where next year's returns are important for next year's you know, beneficiaries, next year's retirees. So, yeah, without a much bigger role, basically, for the state in the pension system, I don't, I don't see that working out. Uh, why are they so big, and is there a scope for smaller asset managers to make a difference? Uh, definitely, there is. You know, definitely, smaller asset managers are in a better position to do more than the big ones. However, the big ones are in in the market for asset management services. I think pretty unassailable at this point. They have, you know, a quasi monopoly, uh, Vanguard and BlackRock, uh, for partly for the reason that you mentioned. 
um, but of course, you know, they're not immune to political intervention, um, not, not at all. Um, but yeah, I don't think they will be outcompeted without political intervention by anyone just because boutique asset management firms have a better offering. I don't see that happen. I mean, they can always buy them, you know, uh, which they are doing, of course. I mean, see, see, see how Google and Amazon operate. Um, um, and then political connections, uh, Ch um, Asia, China. Uh, just very brief comment on the geopolitics of asset manager capitalism. You will be hard pressed to find statements from asset managers that are anywhere as hawkish as the statements uh, coming from Silicon Valley. Um, on on China, and I guess that's you know telling fact. I mean, I haven't seen a single one. They they want access to ch China, the Chinese saber. Um, yeah. Yeah, that's the next frontier. Yeah. <laughs> but they might be losing it now. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thanks so much, Ben. That was uh, fantastic. <laughs>